Good morning, everybody. We're we're in session four. If you have a book, it's uh, page one twenty three, I think. And the book is Romans. It's chapter twelve. Um, and we're talking about today commitment, specifically commitment to the church. Um, when we start out in chapter 12, Paul, um, in the first couple of verses, he's talking about making ourselves a sacrifice, a sacrifice of ourselves. And that sacrifice of ourselves just means uh, service, service to God. And service to God is, is service, it's, it's a complex thing. It's, it's service to um, God, obeying God, uh, but it's service to, um, to others as well. That's all a big part of it. And it's service to people uh, out there in the world, and service to uh, institutions that do the will of God, and the service to uh, each other here in the church as well. So and that's what that's the part of it that we're talking about in this lesson here. That's that's what we're talking about being committed to the church. Um, so let's pray, and we'll we'll get started with the lesson. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the uh, the great blessing to be uh, the opportunity to be together here in your church, to gather together, to study your word. We pray, Father, that the great teacher, thy Holy Spirit, will be among us today. Let us understand what you would have us understand, to take away what you'd have us take away. And Father, we pray that you would uh, be with us through the entire service today and that, that we would go out of here and, and just to, to be celebratory that we were able to, to gain so much from being just children of God and worshipers of you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's look at the first few verses here. We're in Romans 12, verses 3 through 5 is the first part here. And this is the apostle writing to uh, the church, uh, the Roman church. It's um, uh, 12 and 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. So when he starts talking about uh, humility, he says not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So he knows what he's talking about when he says so. He says his authority comes from a grace that's given to him. So when he says the grace given to me, what's he talking about? Paul has a special uh, grace given to him to, uh, to know what he's talking about when he talks about not taking yourself uh, so seriously, not thinking of yourself too highly. And it's in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. It's something we've heard about a lot. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So his grace is this thorn in the flesh, so that, that he would not think himself so high. And I think he's talking about that when he says, This is the, this is, uh, the grace given to me so that I can warn you don't take yourselves so seriously. Don't take yourselves to be so great uh, because you'll fall into a lot of traps that way. Humility is what it's all about. And uh, he knows what he's talking about. But he notice he doesn't say uh, about esteem. He doesn't want to assist us to esteem ourselves above or below what we're supposed to. He says not to esteem ourselves above measure or more highly. He says, uh, esteem yourselves 
about <laughs> what you're supposed to. But don't esteem yourselves too low either. He says, think soberly. So you've got to give yourself the correct credit because if we, if we think too lowly of ourselves, we'll start to think, well, there's nothing I can do for the service of the church. There's some, nothing I can do to serve God. I don't have what it takes or I don't have uh, the skills that are needed to serve God or to serve our church. And that's just not true because uh, if, if you're here today and you're a member of the church, you've got something to contribute. That is a guarantee that's in the Bible from from the word. So we don't have, uh, you know, if you're reading through and you see some of these lists that Paul gives out several places in the Bible and you you say, I, that, I don't really have anything on that list, so I guess I'm good. I don't have to do anything. And first of all, that's not the right attitude. But second of all, that's no, those aren't, all the, all the list, that list is not exhaustive. That's not all the gifts you can possibly have. You've got a gift. That's guaranteed. So all Christians receives that measure of faith that Paul is talking about. And he's going to point out later, you have spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts that, that you can contribute to the church. So why do we worry about whether or not we we think too high or too low of ourselves well, because it does affect our service to the church and it affects the unity of the church. So if you look in verse 4 there, he talks about, for, we as, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So we are as a single body when we are a church. So every part of the body is meant to work in unity. Every part of the church is supposed to work in unity as well. If you look at the, uh, the second paragraph on 124 there, the lesson talks about this. It says, Our physical bodies provide a great illustration of how we are one in the church. Look at your hands. Look closely at each individual finger. Look at your feet. Grab a mirror and look at your nose and eyes. Consider how incredibly different your hands, feet, nose, and eyes are from one another. Each one functions separately and they certainly don't look at all alike. But everyone is a part of you. You are one singular body, all made up of different, unique, and amazing parts. While your right thumb or your left eye is a distinct part of your body, both are still parts of your body, and that reality simply cannot be changed or altered. So it is with the church. So, Every part of the body is part of the body. So, and uh, there is no uh, mention here that any tiny part of the body is not part of the body. So, uh, I think it's probably everybody here has stubbed your little toe at some point in your life, right? It's a very small part of your body. But if you stub your little toe, you'll start to limp, won't you? Right? And what happens, the first thing when you stub your toe is your mouth's going to open or your teeth, you're going to grit your teeth. That's affected another part of your body. Your, your vocal cords are going to be affected when you scream, right? And you'll be walking like this. Your arm's going to swing. Your whole body will be affected by just that little part of your body. So when one part of the body completely turns from the will of the rest of them, that's also a problem, too. Um, I remember uh, years ago, I was in a doctor's office and I picked up a, a medical magazine and I read about uh, something really horrific. It's called alien hand syndrome. And it happens where uh, sometimes people that have had a blood clot in the brain or they have a surge, brain surgery or spinal surgery and it goes wrong. And thankfully, it's a temporary thing, usually. But what will happen is... Um, you'll have uh, usually a hand or an arm uh, that you can't control. And not only that you can't control it, it will do things on its own. It'll touch your face or it will grab things off the table and it, it seems to be, have a mind of its own. And they call that the alien hand syndrome. And people that get it, you know, it will come on them all of a sudden and it's very frightening. Right to, to, to not have control of your hand or arm and, and it seems like it's under somebody else's control. Really all it is is you have a subconscious that does things like 
when you're watching TV, you reach over and grab a cup for you, you scratch your face. Your arm is still under the control of that, but it's cut off from your conscious mind. It's all that it is, but your arm has gone away from your conscious mind. That part of your body has gone away from the rest for, for a, a short amount of time. That can cause all kinds of chaos and, and horror and strangeness. Well, when a part of the church goes very far away from the will of the church there, it, it can cause chaos too. So we're supposed to be in unity as well as a church, and, and we don't want to have the alien hand here in the church. So we've got to be careful about that. So even though we are many and growing, we are made up of one body of Christ. This is this church. Let's read the third paragraph on 124. It says, Paul took it a step further. It's not just that you are connected to Christ and I am connected to Christ, but we are every one members of one another. We need each other and we belong to each other. My role in the body of Christ is integral to your role in the body of Christ, and your role is equally essential in how I carry out my role. Christ has formed his church so that we need each other if it is to function as a healthy body. All this is only possible because we are in Christ. The world looks at diversity and creates divisions, and unfortunately believers have often bought into these divisions. The world sees black and white, Republican and Democrat, blue collar and white collar, and so on. With that mindset, we separate ourselves into camps, tending to stick with those who are just like me. But within the church, those divisions are meaningless. Christ reaches into all these silos of distinction and brings people to faith in him. He loves us all equally and brings us together through our shared faith. So not only are we all each anchored by love to Christ, but also to one another. And it's, it's a lot like, I think, you know, the... The, the spider making the web. If you've ever seen them speed it up on these science channels. The spider makes the web. First of all, she connects it to the ceiling, then the wall, then she just goes back and forth. And if they make these really complex webs, it's gonna be, she connects it to a wall, then another wall, then maybe a piece of furniture, and then the floor, and she's got several different points that it's connected to. And then once she's got all the strands connected, then she starts to connect each of those strands in a big circle. So not only are, is, are all the anchor points connected to something, each little strand of the web's connected to each other, and that makes it work. Otherwise, it's just a bicycle wheel and nothing's connected. Uh, so that's what we are. We're all anchored by Christ, but we're also anchored to one another, and that's what makes it all work. And it's all interconnected, and it, that spider web uh, is, is such a, a good example, you know, because that web is interconnected, and we're interconnected as a church, and interconnectivity and webs, they sort of go together, you know. Um, things that are interconnected, we call a web. The website is something that's out on the Internet. They used to call the Internet the World Wide Web. That's why you put WWW in there, you know. We've got a web that goes beyond the world. This is the web of Christianity. It goes from here to heaven, and it's all interconnected. And uh, we've, we are part of that, and we should re be respectful of that and, and take advantage of it, really, because it, uh, it, it can be a source of strength for us all, just like it is for, uh, for that spider. So uh, let's look at uh, the, 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 the rest of the verses here. Let's go to Romans 12, 6 through 8. And this is getting into the gifts, the spiritual gifts that we've been given so that we can serve the church, maintain unity, and strengthen the church. So Paul begins uh, with, uh, with uh, verse 6 there. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do with, with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So he starts talking about 
the gifts that the Spirit has given each of us and, and what we're supposed to do with them. If you look on 126, uh, that first paragraph talks a little more about it. It says, we need one another to grow, flourish, and become everything God has called us to be. Other believers help and support us through the different gifts he has given to each one of us. We often refer to these gifts as spiritual gifts. When we are saved, each one of us, each member of the body of Christ, is given a unique gifting that we are to use for the purpose of helping the body of Christ, the church, be everything she has been created and called to be. So remember, when we talk about, about gifts, you know, everybody, everybody in the world has a separate and specific mental or biological gifts. Even even non-believers have those, and that's uh, that's laid out in Matthew five forty-five. He says that about God that He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. It's God has a common grace that He gives to humanity. Just because God is good, He gives abilities to people so that the human race in general will survive and be able to survive in the world. But we're talking about something different. This is a spiritual gift that we receive when we become a child of God. And when we receive this gift, it's, it's not for our own benefit. It's to use to serve the church and to serve God. And spiritual gifts like that, they only, be, they only come through the Holy Spirit of God. He is the only one who can give them to us. And, and that's, people who are not... Uh, who are not of God, they don't have these spiritual gifts. Now, they will fool themselves into thinking that they do, or fool themselves into thinking they get spiritual gifts from somewhere else. They don't. But those who have a spiritual gift, you've got to find out what it is, and you've got to use it. Because the spiritual gift is, again, like a body part. If, if, uh, if you have a gift and you don't use it, it's going to be just like a, a body part. If you have ever had a cast on your arm for a long time and you get it taken off, your arm is really puny and doesn't have any strength in it. Sometimes you won't even be able to lift your arm without some therapy or something because you haven't used it. It gets puny and weak. Your spiritual gift will do the same. If you don't use it, it'll get puny and weak. And you won't be doing everything that you could do to serve God. And uh, you might need to, to uh, just uh, search it out and find out what it is. If it's grown weak, it may be difficult, more difficult for you to find out what it is. But it's not gone away. Uh, God's going to find out, help you find it, if you really earnestly want to find it, what your spiritual gift is or gifts. And Paul gives us a list of common spiritual gifts, but again, it's not, not all the gifts that you could possibly have. So what are the gifts that he talks about? He talks about prophecy. Now, we've heard about prophecy a lot in the Bible. But prophecy is, is not pronouncing the future. It's not standing on the mountaintops and pronouncing the will of God. Prophets have done that, yeah. That's been part of the the uh, job of a lot of biblical prophets, yeah. But the biggest part of the job of the prophets was to listen to God, to pray, to serve, to try to understand his will, and then to give advice based on that kind of discernment. It's almost a whole range of sub-gifts underneath that gift. And if you read about the old prophets of old, it, that for making foretelling and, and, and uh, prophecies of the future and things like that. And that was just a very small part of what they did. They advised all the kings and the leaders of old, of the tribes of old. And, and you know, those kings, they didn't just take the prophets and, and put them in the corner and, and, and they say, you know, let me know when the radio signal from God comes through and you've got something to say. When you've come back from your time travel and you have a future thing to tell me, just say it. They relied on the wisdom of these people. It was gained from listening and understanding what God wanted. And now we could probably say, now we could say, I guess for sure, uh, is reading and studying as part of that. 
And that, that's what prophecy is. So that, that's a spiritual gift that's still around. He talks about ministry in verse 7. In Greek, ministry is diakonia. It means to serve others or to aid others. And we get the word deacon from this Greek word. So that's a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit of God just to be a servant to others. And sometimes it is difficult to serve others, isn't it, rather than ourselves. So it is a, it is a spiritual gift from God. Now, now, everybody can learn to be a servant, but to be especially good at it is a gift from God. To be especially, so especially good at it that we would call it a spiritual gift that stands above, is that, that's a gift from God. So if you're especially good at serving others, that's a gift from God that you can use in the church. And that says a lot, I think, about the nature of God, that one of the spiritual gifts that he gives that is on the same level, remember, none of these are greater or worse than any other spiritual gift. On the same level as prophecy is, I'm good at serving others. That's the nature of the God that we serve. He talks about teaching there. Teaching, that's a spiritual gift, has many flavors, you know, uh, what you are gifted to teach, um, who you can teach, different people, different ages, different people from different backgrounds, or different subjects that you can teach. It's all be a different sort of gift, or you may have be able to teach different kinds of people, different kinds of things. A setting that you can teach in. Do you teach a group? Are you better at teaching one one on one? Can you lead a large group uh, study or? Are you better with a small group? You could start your uh, a small Bible study. Or uh, if you're better at just teaching one-on-one, you know, you could just teach your, teach your family. Lead your family in, in some kind of Bible study. He talks about exhortation. Exhortation means to call people to the Lord. And the Greek word paraklesis has a dual meaning. It means to call people, but also to to call people to the Lord, but also to call people to comfort and rest. But really, that's just the same thing, isn't it? To call people to God and to call them to be comforted is the same thing. That's a spiritual gift, too. That's what Brother Bill does up here, exhortation. Giving, that's a gift from God, too, that he mentions. It's a gift from God to be able to freely give. Now, that includes any kind of giving. That includes giving time, effort, resources to the church. And Paul says to do it with simplicity. So what does it mean to do it with simplicity? Well, without a second thought, be the first one, but also without complicating it, without giving without any attachments, giving it without requirements, without expectations. And that's any kind of giving. If, you, if you're giving to any charities out there in the world, if you're giving to the church, if you're, if you're just giving to somebody who's in need out there in the world, don't give with any, any attachments, right? Uh, he sa- uh, uh, Jesus was, uh, very, said a lot about, you know, the reasons that we give being very important, much more important than what we give, how much we give, are the reasons that we give. So uh, it is a gift from God to be able to freely give that way and, and to be able to freely give um, without those kind of attachments it can be a spiritual gift for us if we do it right. He talks about ruling. That is just leadership. And it's a lot that have that gift around here, thankfully. Um, and if you do have a gift for that, and you think you do have a gift for that, you should get into, uh, uh, get into it. So, it's, you know, churches, uh, they love bureaucracies. You know, I was, looked at the, the list that we had up there. It was... Um, you know, we don't have nearly enough committees for a church. You know, church got to have a lot of committees, right? So get on a committee or start one. Probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> if you have a gift for leadership, that's been given to you to use. So you've got to use it somehow. It doesn't have to be a church leadership position. It just has to be, you can stand up and, and lead a song over here, just one, Right? You could, uh, you could stand up and give testimony. That's leadership, too. You're going to lead people to a greater understanding of what God does in a person's life. That's leadership, too. And 
helping people to understand. And if, you, if you're leading, Paul says, just to be diligent about it, right? So uh, if you are a leader already, then be diligent about it. We want to we wanna squeeze all the work out of you that we can here at the church. So finally, Paul talks about mercy. Mercy just showing compassion, but this, is, this can be words or deeds. And that's, again, just as valuable as any spiritual gift. Leadership, prophecy, giving, just being merciful, showing compassion. And that's given by the Holy Spirit of God. And again, the fact that God regards this as something so valuable that, that he would give you this from the Holy Spirit of God, that says a lot about God. And if you have it, you've got to look for ways to exercise it. And... Uh, and you'll find a way. God will, fi- will find ways for us to exercise these gifts. And sometimes um, uh, that kind of gift will, uh, if, you, if you have a gift, you feel like it's not being utilized, just ask around. Some people uh, have gifts of helping you find your gift. So let's move on to the last part. This is verses 9 through 16 where Paul talks about Love in the church. He says, um, Romans 12 and 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Let's stop there and and look at just that part. So the secret is just love. If you look on 128, the book talks about, about love there. It says, what a beautiful picture it is. Surely, sorry, it's 130. Did I get it right one? Mm, oh, sorry. Yes, 128, the second, or the first paragraph there. In verse 9, Paul gave us the secret ingredient that enables the body of Christ to grow, thrive, and become the healthiest version of itself, love. This is the Greek word agape, a word that expresses the essential nature of God. This is not a term that describes emotions. It is a word about how we act. We're not called to just have warm and fuzzy feelings about the church. Rather, we are to love the church by serving her with our hearts and lives. We act with a love-infused, all-in commitment to Christ's church. Paul built on this agape love by referring in verse 10 to Philadelphia, brotherly love. We are to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Okay, so love is what it's all about. It says in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. That's another one I had to look up. It just means to conceal one's thoughts, feelings, or character, or to pretend. So the love has to be real and not pretend. We're to abhor that which is evil. Well, what is evil when we're talking about love? Well, it's false love. It's that pretend love. It's love that's for personal gain or for any other purpose other than the selflessness. Paul tells us to be not slothful which is lazy or dragging feet in church business, not slothful in business, he says. So we've got to get it done when it's time to get it done. He says, be rejoicing, be hopeful, be patient. And notice he says, he did not say that we are promised that, that the church will never have hardship. He doesn't say that we're promised that the church will never have any problems. What he does say is that we're to be hopeful and patient and pray during those times he gives us the remedy he says that the hardship can be overcome with those things with hope and prayer and rejoicing so paul tells us he says take care of one another the saints when he talks about saints that's the saved and i wouldn't go around calling myself saint so and so but you are a saint if you are saved and we start should show hospitality to one another then also to visitors who come to the church, but also to the community that this church is in. Hospitality and uh, 
take care of people. That'll make the church stronger. So let's look at 14, and 15, 14 through 16 there. It says, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So that's general good advice for how to deal with people. But remember, he's talking mostly about how to uh, comport ourselves in the, in the family of God, in the church. So when he says, bless them with persecute you, bless and curse not. Um, that means inside the church and outside. And in verse 15, it regard, is regarding jealousy. When he says talking about, he's talking about spiritual gifts here, or, or any gift, he wanted to be sure he warned us against jealousy because it's human nature when we see somebody who is rejoicing. Human nature, jealousy. I want to have that. I want to have that ability, that thing, that gift that you have. Christ's nature is to rejoice with them, Right? And we are supposed to have the Christ nature. It's the same with grief. When, when we see someone grieving, human nature is, oh, let's give them space. I don't want to have anything to do with grief. I might get some grief on me, and then I'll be grieving or sad. We're not supposed to be like that in the church or outside the church. We're supposed to grieve with them. When you're grieving, you know, you, nobody wants to grieve alone. You want to have someone with you. So that's a service we can provide uh, to each other and, and to everyone. And Paul says um, to be of the same mind, and that's on page 130. If you look at that paragraph, it talks about that. It's the second paragraph on 130 there. What a beautiful picture it is. Surely anyone among us would want to be a part of a church full of members like that. But this beautiful picture of what the church is to be begins with you and me. Why should we love and serve the church in this sacrificial way? Because that is exactly how Christ loved us. Jesus didn't sit back in heaven, fold his arms, and tell us to get our act together before he would love us. Despite all our failures and shortcomings, he left the glory of heaven, put on our broken flesh, and came to this planet for one reason, to love us. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in Romans 5.8. If Jesus loves us, his bride, in this sacrificial way, how then can we not love her in the same way? You know, there are, there are husbands out there that you think you're very, very good. I can say this because I'm not married. I can make fun of husbands. <laughs> Uh, husband, y'all, husbands out there, you think you're good. Sometimes you rem you will remember they will remember the anniversary or the birthday, and you think, hey, I'm pretty good. I remembered one in ten anniversaries. You get her flowers, you get her candies. Imagine how much more the ultimate bridegroom will give to his bride. Gifts. Paul says, be not wise in your own conceits. That's in your own consideration. Let's not consider ourselves too wise because we don't even know the gifts that are in store for us because we haven't looked all the way. If you think you know it all, you don't know. I would bet every one of us here have probably a couple of spiritual gifts we haven't yet explored. And it may be that the purpose for them hasn't come by yet, but get ready. As soon as we think ourselves so wise that we, we can't be taught a lesson, we know it all. We've experienced it all. We've understood it all. That's when we will be taught a lesson. And that happens throughout the Bible. Even the greatest prophets, even the greatest kings, when they were even, even the wisest man, <laughs> when they thought he knew everything, he was taught a lesson. Um, and those lessons, you know, they are hard. They were hard for them. And if we, if we get out of line and, and think that we know everything, they'll be hard for us. But even lessons like those are, 
are gifts <laughs> because learning like that is a gift. So let's try not to pursue those particular gifts. Let's pursue the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, I think we'll do well if we just, if we just keep to that. Search out, search out your spiritual gifts, but foremost, let's serve each other. And, and we'll find the gifts. Just, just be servants. And let's pray and we'll end there. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day. We thank you for this beautiful earth. We thank you for the ability to come together in this church family. We thank you for one another, Father, for the unity of this church. We pray that it will go on and continue as we grow and grow. We pray that you'll be with us, Father, for the rest of the service. Be with our song leaders. Be with Brother Bill as he brings the message. Be with everyone that is here. Be with everyone who could not be here, Father. We know that Every need is yours to address according to thy will, and we pray that you will just do so. It is our, our fervent hope that, that all things resolve just according to your will and not ours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.